everyone, welcome back to my channel Lisa Does Science. Today I've prepared for you a short introduction to the brain anatomy and we'll be discussing human brain uh, basic anatomy and features. To, so let's get straight into it. To start off with, I've prepared a slide that depicts the brains of different species and as you can see, the mo most obviously um, brain expanded in its volume of course and we know this from the evolutionary point of view but another feature that you could probably notice from those images is that if you compare zebrafish and mouse brains for example to those of humans and our um, relatives in a way rhesus macaque as um, you can see that it's no longer smooth so those extensive infolds are called gyri and what they do is that they expand the surface area of the cortex meaning that um, the total surface area would increase of course allowing um, more um, cortical processing to take place and of course more neurons to be there and this process is called gerification. So with evolution, the extent of gerification in case of humans before us, before Homo sapiens, had um, lower brain volumes, meaning that the uh, human brain volume expanded with time. But of course, um, the brain volume or the brain size itself doesn't necessarily matter because we know that in other species, for example, um, in uh, dolphins, the brain is quite uh, high uh, in volume and quite big in mass. What is probably more important is the ratio of brain size to the body size. And we know that in humans, it's about 1 in 40 or about 2% because the average brain weighs around 3 pounds or 1.5 kilos. So this is important to understand. And moving on now to the different views of the brain. So this is probably the most common view used in literature and in media is the lateral view where you can see the brain from the side. And what the diagram on the left shows is the system of ventricles. And ventricles are the hollow structures of the brain where the cerebrospinal fluid is being made. And, of course, on the right here, you have a mid-sagittal view, meaning this is a sagittal cut taken right in the middle, so between the two hemispheres of the brain. And here in blue is the cerebral cortex. And another unique feature of human brain specifically, in comparison to other species, is the expansion of cortex in general. So, as you can see, cortex takes up um, the vast amount of volume in comparison to other parts of the brain referred to as subcortical structures. And here we see thalamus. And thalamus in Greek means chamber, and thalamus is the main hub or uh, the relay center of all the subcortical uh, signals that then uh, the information is being passed into the cortex uh, via thalama cortical neurons that signal to the cortex. And then we have in grey, in light grey, the brain, this is uh, referred to sometimes as the reptile brain. From the evolutionary point of view, this is probably the most ancient structure and it is comprised of the midbrain, which is the smallest part of the brainstem. Then we have pons. Pons literally means the bridge, uh, and it's called that because it sort of connects the cerebellum to the rest um, of the brain. And we also have medulla oblongata, which is the most posterior structure of the brainstem. And then it directly um, joins on with the spinal cord uh, here below the cerebellum. So uh, as you probably guessed, uh, since it's called the reptile brain, uh, is that it carries out the most vital, the most essential functions 
such as, for example, regulating respiration, which is both medulla and pons are involved in. Uh, pons is also involved in potentially regulating um, sleep, more specifically the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. And medulla also regulates uh, cardiac function. Um, it also regulates vomiting and other um, aut autonomic function. So it's extremely important uh, and here we have cerebellum, and both cerebellum and brainstem, as I've said, are referred to sometimes as the reptile brain, or the most ancient part of our brain. Let's look at the cortex more closely. So cerebral cortex is topographically divided into four main, main lobes, and they are called, according to the skull bones, uh, that surround those lobes. So we have frontal lobe in blue here at the front of the brain. Posterior to frontal lobe, we have parietal lobe. And posterior to parietal lobe, we have occipital lobe right at the back of the brain. And here on the side, we have temporal lobe, of course, because of the temporal, um, um, temporal bone or temple on the side of the brain. And let's talk about uh, those jari that I've mentioned before and those grooves that separate the jari or the infolds of the brain are called sulci or sulcus in singular. So the main sulci that will help you with the anatomy of the brain are depicted here. So importantly, we have a lateral or sylvian fissure here that stretches and separates temporal lobe from frontal and parietal lobes. We also have the central sulcus that separates frontal from parietal and parietal occipital from parietal and occipital lobes, as the name suggests. Um, we also have precentral sulcus uh, before uh, the structure called precentral gyrus and postcentral sulcus after the structure called central gyrus as well. So all of those names are quite logical and that would just help you to orientate yourselves better around the brain. So what are the main gyri of each of those lobes? As you could probably see, the system is pretty similar across the lobes. We have superior and inferior gyri here in frontal, parietal, and temporal, we also have middle uh, gyra in frontal and temporal, um, and as well as the structures that I've already mentioned, precentral and precentral gyra, and they're quite important, and I'll come back to them uh, in a moment. And here, um, in the occipital lobe, we just refer to this as the lateral occipital lobe. So what are the most important areas that are commonly mentioned for um, brain anatomy introduction um, for beginners? So we have precentral and postcentral gyri, as I've already mentioned, but their other names are primary motor area and primary somatosensory area. So as you can see, they regulate motor movement, but all receive sensory information. Within the frontal lobe, we also have Broca's area that is needed for speech production, so the motor movement that's concerned with speech production, so the tongue movement and mouth movement. People who have damage to this area are perfectly capable of understanding and perceiving speech, what the struggle is the production of letters and sounds of words. Uh, then we have Wernicke's area, which is also related to speech. However, it's located in the superior temporal gyrus. And people with damage to this area, however, uh, cannot perceive the speech. They can produce words uh, perfectly well, However, it would sound more like a word salad if you heard it. So it's just random words mixed together without 
any meaning behind them or without the semantics of the speech. Back to the frontal lobe, we have a prefrontal cortex that is responsible for the executive functions such as decision making, planning, working memory, emotional control, personality, etc. And orbitofrontal area is particularly important for switching between different mental states and emotional control. And interestingly, it's one of the latest areas uh, to be fully matured during development and that which takes place uh, in teenage years. We uh, also have, of course, occipital lobe, which contains primary and higher order visual cortices that are important for visual information processing. And this is everything for me uh, for the beginner's guide to brain anatomy and major areas. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. And if you have any requests for future videos, please let me know down below. Thank you so much for your support. And don't forget to subscribe, of course. Thank you.